Hello everyone, I'm here with another monthly recap, this time taking a look back at what else I saw in October. I was able to review six movies last month, which is not a record, but is more than usual. That makes this list smaller, of course, because everything balances out. Last month also didn't play out quite the way I'd expected. Uh, there were a lot of movies that I had planned to watch or that came across my path and I intended to watch them, but it just didn't work out. I didn't have the time, I didn't make the time, it wasn't the right time. It's not a bad thing, and I'm not disappointed, it just... it happens. So I have a smaller group of movies to talk about, but it's a mix as usual, and hopefully something will catch your interest. Movie number one came out last year, Ford vs. Ferrari, which on the outside is about the development of a car that the Ford Motor Company will be able to enter at Le Mans, the famous 24-hour race, in order to beat Ferrari's seemingly undefeatable sports cars. But the story actually focuses more on the people, specifically the relationship between Matt Damon's character, Carol Shelby, former racer turned designer and businessman, and Christian Bale's character, Ken Miles, superior driver but hot-headed teammate. When I first saw an ad for this movie last year, I figured my dad would want to see it and I was right. He likes cars and car history, so he was enthusiastic about this one, and he could tell you all about the event before watching the movie. But I can testify that you don't necessarily have to be a fan of cars or racing or these stars to thoroughly enjoy this movie. I didn't care much for the 1971 film Le Mans with Steve McQueen, so I did have my concerns about whether I'd be able to get into this. However, it was no problem. I found it to be a very good, engaging film. The competitive sequences are thrilling and tense, but so are the scenes where the leads butt heads with the men in suits, and the whole thing's supported by a compelling drama. The chummy chemistry between Damon and Bale works great, holding the plot together through various ups and downs, and making a story that I might not have cared much about otherwise into something both surprisingly funny and emotional. Movie number two is 1961's Twenty Plus Two, a kind of mystery film in which a movie star's secretary is found murdered. David Jansen, a couple years before he became the fugitive, stars as a man who tracks down missing heirs so they can collect their inheritance, and he eventually uncovers how this secretary's death ties in with an old missing person case. That's not a great summary, but the plot for this one is pretty loosey-goosey, and the movie never gives you a hint what the title's supposed to mean. But I'd argue that even though the narrative at times gets a little sidetracked, or at least appears to, everything seems to hang together in the end. Now, the movie's got quite a few negative reviews on IMDb, so obviously some people disagree with me, but this is just my opinion. Jansen's character, who is not a detective, as he has to keep reminding people, is likable and chill. Along his journey, he is distracted by a reunion with his ex-fiance, Jean Crane, whose renewed interest in him is questionable, as well as her friend, who he feels he's met before. She's played by Dina Merrill, who was probably too old for her role, especially in the flashbacks. She does okay, it's just hard to buy. The supporting cast also includes Jacques Aubuchon, Brad Dex being creepy, and briefly, William Demarest and Agnes Moorhead. And if you look real quick, you'll catch a glimpse of a young Robert Osborne as a dancing sailor. It's an offbeat movie that seems to want to be more than your run-of-the-mill detective story, with its unusual pacing and romantic emphasis and detective who's not a detective. I was also surprised by some of the subject matter. I'm referring to a spoiler here, so I won't go into detail, except to say there's a description of a past crime that's startling coming from a 1961 movie. Anyway, my mom and I both liked this one. You never know exactly where it's headed, and it's got a fun, jazzy score to give it an occasional boost. Jansen's lead is appealing, and I, for one, got a kick out of the little humorous bits. <coughs> I just choked on my water, so now my voice is all... <sighs> Next up are four movies I watched in a row, because Turner Classic Movies had a Friday night creature feature special and their selections were just too good to pass up, even though I'd seen all of them before and I had a lot of editing to do. 
So I caught some of Creature from the Black Lagoon, one of my favorites, which I've previously reviewed. I watched all of the blob, and a couple of you might be saying, wait a minute, you just watched that, didn't you? Yes, I did, back in April when I reviewed it. But it's one of my mom's favorites, and also we discovered that somehow, in all these years, my dad has never seen it. So we had to remedy that. I saw most of The Tingler, which I've mentioned a couple times before, mostly to say how much it terrified me when I was little. All four of these movies did. I might review The Tingler sometime in the future, but I haven't decided yet, so I'll say a few things about it here. Vincent Price plays a doctor who studies fear and discovers a creature that's attached to the human spinal cord and will kill its host during a moment of terror if the host does not scream. There are lots of great scenes that make it a campy favorite, and one scene that I think is genuinely frightening, though not nearly as scary when you know it's coming and you know what's behind it. That was a little disappointing. The last time I saw that sequence, I had trouble sleeping at night. Uh, however many years later, I knew it was coming and was eagerly anticipating it and realized it's not the same. It's still good. It's just not as effective. It doesn't have that, what is happening, power, you know? I would like to go back in time and see The Tingler in its original theatrical release in 1959 with director and gimmick master William Castle's Percepto buzzers going off in the seats and making people jump up and scream. Um, that sounds like an awesome, unforgettable experience. And I sort of saw all of the thing from another world. I say sort of because I was trying to multitask and get some of that editing done, but I probably watched more than I edited. I definitely plan to review this one sometime in the future, so I'll just say it's one of the best sci-fi horror movies of the 50s. A team of scientists and Air Force guys go to investigate a crashed UFO in the Arctic and end up fighting for their lives against the alien survivor. The setting, the dialogue, the characters, the Howard Hawks style all come together to make it a great movie. <coughs> I just choked on my water again. I'm not sure if I know how to be a human today. Later, we watched Murder on the Blackboard, a whodunit from 1934 in which a young school teacher is murdered. Her body is discovered by one of her co-workers, amateur sleuth Hildegard Withers, who calls on her friend Police Inspector Piper for help solving the crime. This detecting duo is played by Edna Mae Oliver and James Gleason, a quirky combination that somehow works. RKO produced a number of these Hildegard Withers films, which are based on novels by Stuart Palmer. This was the second of three that Oliver and Gleason did together, and Gleason went on to play Piper three times more after after she moved on. I find Edna Mae Oliver to be one of the wittiest character actors of the 30s, and Gleason is playing essentially the same character he'd play ten years later in Arsenic and Old Lace, and you know I love that movie. Admittedly, Murder on the Blackboard itself isn't much to write home about. It's a lightweight mystery with some plot holes and an embarrassingly short list of suspects, and I didn't care that much who killed the victim anyway. But it was an amusing hour and eleven minutes. Like I said, Oliver and Gleason are an odd pair, but they work, I think, and the film has a hint of spookiness, with the leads wandering around the empty school and its basement after hours. And now for something completely different. Unquestionably, the most intense and bloodiest movie I saw in October was 2007's 30 Days of Night. Josh Hartnett stars in this creepy film about a small Alaskan town that finds itself attacked by a vicious horde of vampires during a month-long period of darkness. There's quite a bit of violence and gore in this movie, which was directed by David Slade and based on a graphic novel, but while that kind of thing, as I've said before, isn't generally my cup of tea, the violence and gore that we see is usually so fast and so excessive that it didn't bother me as much. Does that make sense? Um, if it were more drawn out and more harshly realistic, I might not have been able to make it through the film. I told my mom as we started to watch it, if I'm not into this, we're gonna watch something else. <laughs> Especially because I was eating at the time. But it was shot in such a way, and especially edited in such a way, 
that everything happened very quickly. So I was on edge and I was cringing and I did have to look away a couple times, but I didn't feel queasy. And there's a difference. There is, ooh, this is scary, I'm stimulated and I'm enjoying it. And then there's, this is scary and it's also gross and I feel like I'm going to toss my cookies. The film has a desaturated visual style that makes it look like it's been drained of color, like the Batam edit of the 1979 Dracula, I'll point out. There is something bombastic about the action. It's like a nightmare where the laws of physics don't have to apply and your enemy is this relentless thing that just keeps coming and coming and coming. This poor, unsuspecting town is facing such an insane, unpredictable foe. I've never seen vampires that are fast and strong like this. That initial premise, based in reality, a town so far north that its inhabitants don't see the sun for a lengthy period, is one that's already ripe for terror of some kind, tangible or just psychological. To make it a vampire story is a clever move, and the execution is good, keeping the emphasis on the characters and their relationships. If a few of the supporting characters had been just a little more developed, it would have been even better. Survival stories set in freezing climates that have themes of isolation and paranoia tend to appeal to me for some reason. Throw in some terrifying speedy vampires that make this noise, and well, you've got a solid horror movie. And the last movie on today's list is 1956's The Werewolf, a lycanthropy film from Columbia Pictures. Universal's 1941 classic The Wolfman with Lon Chaney Jr. is considered, by most, to be the gold standard for old black and white werewolf movies, but I think this one holds its own pretty well. It's set somewhere in the Northwest, or maybe just a part of California where everyone wears plaid. A mysterious stranger's arrival in town coincides with the death of a man viciously attacked by some kind of wolf-like creature. The lead is the conscientious sheriff, unsure if he should kill or capture this thing, played by Don McGowan. Trivia, he played the Gill Man on land in The Creature Walks Among Us that same year. But the featured actor is Stephen Rich as the werewolf, a regular guy who became an unwilling test subject in an unscrupulous experiment. Rich does a fine job as the tortured soul, himself a victim. I guess I like my werewolf movies angsty. There's an element of tragedy to this film I appreciated, especially in the scenes with his wife. Now, an angsty werewolf is nothing new, not even in 1956, but credit where credit is due. Rich's struggle is a compelling one, as he wanders around with no memory, no identity, and a hideous, uncontrollable urge that terrifies him. The Werewolf was directed by Fred F. Sears, who made Earth vs. the Flying Saucers, and also The Giant Claw. It all looks pretty good for what I must assume was a low-budget movie. They achieved much with very little, often relying on the power of suggestion. It is a little surprising how often you see the werewolf in broad daylight. It's very different from the Wolfman in that regard. The major drawback is that the transformations could have been better. They used a similar effect to what Universal did in the 40s, but the positioning isn't spot on, so the shift isn't as smooth as it could have been. Also, the hair is a bit fluffy. But other than that distraction, I thought this was a very good movie. I'd never heard of it before, so it was a nice discovery. And that's it! That's what else I saw in October. Not counting the bits and pieces of movies that I caught on TV, most of which I had seen before. Time for a Joey update! Number one, I have this little plush Joey with his name on a little bandana, which my brother got for me to commemorate one of the biggest events of this year. Certainly one of the best events of this year. And yes, I am still watching the round-the-clock live stream of Joey the Baby Sea Otter from the Vancouver Aquarium. We all are. I'd say that uh, we're all obsessed in this house. I hope you enjoyed this video. Feel free to share what you think of any of these movies in the comments below, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching!